Number 10. Not so friendly fire. What happens when you mix an Ottoman invasion, alcohol, and gunpowder? I'm not sure, but I imagine it's pretty bad. Just like the Battle of Karensbys, where embarrassingly enough, the Austrian army fired upon itself. Now, looking up military history will tell you that friendly fire incidents are more common than you might think. I'm looking at you, Vietnam War, but this incident is a little more unique as it may have started over a bottle of booze. A group of soldiers procured some alcohol and was enjoying the joys of liquid courage. After getting too boisterous, more Austrians wanted to join in. Not wanting to share their boozy finds and feelings, a fight broke out. The Austrian army was composed of multiple nations, so there were a few different languages being spoken. And by that, I mean a very confusing fight broke out. Eventually, someone fired a shot, someone shouted Turks, and a very embarrassing battle ensued. By the end, it's speculated that 10,000 Austrians were unalived during this boozy mistake. That's, hey, hey, happens. Mistakes are made, happens. Number nine, and on the complete opposite side of that, we have the spy master. Funny enough, Washington actually wasn't keen on becoming president and he hated being general. But the one thing he was really good at and actually kind of partly enjoyed doing was being spy master. The Revolutionary War was ill equipped, being perpetually undermanned and undertrained and undersupplied, so Washington had to think in another way to win, so he developed a secret intelligence network. Washington had a whole ring of spies that were so good, even he didn't know who they all were. They utilized invisible ink to communicate letters, they used anonymous female spies, such as the infamous Agent 3. An African American double agent, a Patriot Taylor who spied while making clothes for British officers, and then several, just so many. He was more deeply involved in the spy ring than any other American general in chief, except for Dwight Eisenhower, who got really involved in World War II, but up until that point, it was just this guy. Number eight, Fairfax. We all have a first love. Some of us are lucky enough to still be with them. Others are lucky enough to find someone even better. Hopefully, this was the case when he found Martha, but his first love was one Sally Fairfax. At 27 years old, Washington had just become engaged to Martha, but that September he wrote a romantic letter to Sally. He goes on to call himself a devotee and describe thousands of tender passages between them. He speaks of destiny that divides him and her from being together, but here is the catch. Sally was the wife of one of his best friends, George William Fairfax. If that wasn't enough to keep them apart, George was about to be married, so it had to be quits. The letter itself doesn't actually openly declare love per se, but something steamy is hidden behind metaphors. We often picture Washington as the white haired old guy on money, but at one time the dude was young, robust, and clearly love struck. Number seven, sparked a war. The history of North America is basically steeped in France and England, stomping over indigenous territory, playing in a game of tug of war, all while dealing with slavery. We're gonna get to all that later. However, Washington, being part of the Virginia militia, was a part of this. He was sent to the Ohio Valley with 10 troops to repel attacks from the French, but may have actually started a war. They had a small indigenous tribe ally with them, and they warned him that the French had a small force set up several miles away. They were supposed to be going to talk to them, but no one knows who fired the first shot, but a skirmish broke out. 10 French soldiers were killed plus one Virginian man, but the most notable death was that of Joseph Coulon de Villiers. He was a noble on a diplomatic mission and his death enraged the French. They were like, we are so angry. Because of this, <laughs> très fâché. Because of this event, the conflict between Britain and France escalated into the French and Indian War. This soon spread into what would soon be known as the Seven Years War. Number six, moving forward together. European settlers were not very nice to Indian tribes. That's probably no surprise to anyone, but what might be unknown to some is Canada's treatment of First Nations peoples. More specifically, residential schools, a system supported by the church and Canadian government to indoctrinate and assimilate First Nations children into European North American culture. Children were forcibly taken from their homes and were forced to learn against their own beliefs, language, and were victims of crimes and physical harm. Sadly for First Nations, this was somewhat effective and did a good job displacing families. The last residential school closed in 1997, which for many is still too recent and a painful reminder of Canada's past. Furthering the horrors of the residential schools was the discovery of unmarked graves in 2021, where hundreds of indigenous children's remains were found, showing that Canada has a long way to go. We can and will do better. Number four, Broken Arrow. The Cold War wasn't exactly cold as nuclear weapons had the potential to make it hot. 
too hot. So here's something to make everyone lose a little more sleep at night because I know everyone at home is stress free right now and gets a full eight hours of sleep. Tonight when you lay your wee head to rest on count sheep, I want you to think about Broken Arrow. No, not actually a Broken Arrow, but the Broken Arrow incident or incidents, which if you didn't know is the code phrase for a nuclear device gun MIA. For example, on July 28th, a US aircraft from Dover Air Force Base, Delaware was carrying three nuclear bombs over the Atlantic Ocean. The plane experienced a loss of power and the crew jettisoned two nuclear bombs into the ocean and they have never been recovered. Wow, that's great. There were at least another dozen broken arrow incidents from the 1950s until the end of the Cold War. Now as bad as that sounds, I mean it's pretty bad. These are our nukes we're talking about. At least America's lost bombs were recorded. Nobody really knows how many bombs the Soviet Union lost during the Cold War. Gee, now I feel real swell and safe. Number three, speaking of slaves, we have Harry. If George was such a benevolent master, then why did his slaves want to leave? Answer is simple, because people are not objects and can't and shouldn't be owned. Harry was one of Washington's slaves and would gain popularity when he escaped Washington upwards of twice. The first time Washington paid one pound and three shillings to, and I quote, advertise for the recovery of his property. Though Washington was later for the abolitionist movement, he was a shrewd businessman and knew that should his slaves be freed, the Virginia economy would be in peril. So he fought as hard as he could to keep them as long as he could. In November 14th, 1775, John Murray declared any slaves will be freed if they were willing to bear arms to the British crown. Harry ran like hell, as did many others. This time, Washington hired a slave catcher who managed to return seven of what he determined was his property, but not Harry. He was currently serving as a corporal in the Dunmore's All Black Loyalist Regiment. He managed to evade him after the war, but life continued to be unkind to Harry and his wife. White settlers in Nova Scotia underpaid them and conditions were terrible. His tale sadly goes cold after he started a rebellion that got him banished at age 60 in Sierra Leone. Number two, which brings us to it's complicated and awful. So as we know from the above, Washington owned a lot of slaves and it was really complicated. If Washington fought with the abolitionist movement and wanted slaves to be free, why did he have so many? By law, Martha nor George could set these people free. However, George put it in his will to ensure that every slave he owned be freed after his passing. Martha, his wife, made sure this happened, though it took a long time. It took until like 801 for everyone to be emancipated. However, despite this, his treatment of his slaves is still questionable. Visitors to Mount Vernon left behind conflicting accounts of Washington's treatment of his slaves. He frequently whipped and enforced hard labor, even forcing them to work 24 hours. On New Year's Day in 1789, he requested that his people work as soon as it was light and work until it was dark. He heavily relied on his people to work his Virginia plantation so that he could run a profit. In fact, this was the nature of the South, and Washington, being a businessman, knew that if slaves were free, the economy would soon snowball. So, like I said, pretty complicated and really awful. Was he for or against slavery regardless of public opinion? If he had been given the choice to buy slaves, would he have? Who knows? But I think we can all agree that the fact that he owned and worked slaves is pretty messed up. People aren't property. And last but not least, his death. George Washington was terrified of being buried alive and ordered that his body not be touched until three days after his death just in case. Throughout his life, he survived multiple near-death experiences from diphtheria, tuberculosis, smallpox, malaria, dysentery, quinsy, carbuncle, and pneumonia. This man wasn't about to die easily. He even survived near drowning in ice and the burning and massacre of Fort Necessity. But in the end, it was a cold, something that today could have easily been fixed with some antibiotics. But instead, his doctors are really what did it. They essentially nursed him to death. They bloodletted him, removing around 40% of his own blood, for example. They even burned him. They made him gargle vinegar and molasses, which caused him to choke. It was a lot. It was actually this treatment that had the 1,000 year old tradition of bloodletting finally called into question. Number 10, starting off strong with a mule breeder. Out of all the things I thought I'd learn about this dude, this was not one of them. A mule breeder. George Washington loved animals. I like that. A mule is a cross between a horse and a donkey and they are particularly important for American farmers and so Washington made it a priority. He is believed to be responsible for creating the mule stock that supported the agricultural community in the south. But he didn't stop there, oh no. Washington loved dogs including Dalmatians, Foxhounds, French Hounds, Greyhounds, Italian Greyhounds, Mastiffs, Newfoundlands, Pointers, Spaniels and Terriers, there's a lot. Lions, Tigers and Bear, oh my. 
A huge dog lover, he bred hunting dogs for speed over the years and gave them cute names like Sweet Lips, Sweet Lips, Venus, True Love, Taster, Tippler, Drunkard, and Madam Moose. <laughs> Weird, okay? Those are some names. Number nine, Daily Depp. As recorded in his diary from 1818, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, loved to skinny dip. Yeah, this guy was part of Marky Mark Wahlberg's 4 a.m. workout club, I swear to God. In his diary, he would wake up every morning at 4 a.m., walk two miles to the Potomac River, get butt-ass naked, and then take a nice little dip. He would do some frog kicks totally naked, do some butterflies, the whole thing, just a nice workout all alone. And then he would walk home, I would assume slash hope clothed. He was well educated and on his off time he would read and skinny dip. Honestly, maybe that's the secret to life. Just grab Goblet of Fire and then take a new dip. That's it, you're feeling refreshed in four hours or less. 10 points to Gryffindor, hit that thumbs up. Let's move on. Number eight, Tilted Head. I don't think this is weird by any means, but it's too interesting to leave out. James Buchanan, the 15th president of the United States, he always had a head tilt in every portrait, and even in his daily activities, when he would talk to you, he would always tilt his head. He always looked interested. He did like that Larry David kind of, hmm, interesting, but he kept it in one spot. He looked engaged in the conversation, but he had the headshot attitude going even back in the 1800s. He would just cock, tilt, boom, eyebrow up all the time, always judging you. Well, it was believed by historians that he did this because he had a defect in one of his eyes. Maybe he wasn't paying attention at all during those conversations because maybe he had a headache that entire time. Today we believe he suffered from exodeviation, which is a wandering eye. Number seven, a baker's dozen. When we think of John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States, and anything weird or scandalous that happened around him, obviously we're thinking of the whole Marilyn Monroe thing. The guy had more than one affair though. He had at least 13, maybe even more. Judith Exner was introduced to John F. Kennedy by Frank Sinatra. Yeah, it's not a bad introduction. At that time, Kennedy was hanging out with the Rat Pack. Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., Exner was first to come forward and say that Kennedy wasn't that great of a guy, so pretty big deal. The Kennedy administration worked with mobsters during Operation Mongoose, and Exner at one point claimed that she was pregnant with his child. He was also at one point seeing a Soviet spy while he was working in the Navy. Her name was Ingrid Arbat. But his father told him to call it off because it would impact his political future. He also hooked up with a 19-year-old Mimi Alford, who at the time was a White House intern. That affair lasted 18 months. And perhaps the most interesting affair here was with Mary Pinchot Meyer. She was the ex-wife of one CIA agent for one is Red Flag City. I would not date anybody who's close to the CIA, father, husband, brother. No, nope, I'm all set. But sadly, she was shot and killed in mysterious circumstances in 1964, just one year after Kennedy died as well. Many believe this was done to prevent Meyer from opening up about her affair. And as far as affairs go, this is just scratching the John F. Kennedy surface. If we do a part two, I'll for sure add more to this list. Number six, indigenous relations. We kind of spoke about that earlier, but here we go. We're going to go more in depth. Despite years and years of having to endure the BS that the Europeans put them through, like smallpox, I don't know, stealing their territory, all that stuff, you know the drill. Somehow they were able to create pockets of allies with Native Americans. I don't know how. Throughout his life, Washington negotiated with Native Americans, served alongside them, fought against them, and sought their land. Like literally a walking contradiction all the time. It just looks like he just kind of did what he needed to do regardless and just as long as it got him where he wanted to go. He respected their war tactics and even implemented some of them during the Revolutionary War. But then he would turn on them again. As commander in chief, he instructed armed forces to attack native nations allied with the British or those who resisted the expansion. When he became president, he followed the movement that wanted Native Americans to assimilate to their Western ideas. He just. What? What the heck was it, man? You could fight you could fight beside them, but you couldn't respect them? I don't understand this. Number five, dentures. By 1789, because of health and happenstance, Washington had only one tooth left in his mouth. That was his. Most of his food had to be softened and chopped up into little pieces so he could eat it. It was also why he didn't smile. But the man was fitted with some of the earliest dentures and they were not comfy. In fact, they caused further disfigurement later on in his life. One of the most ridiculous and most famous rumors surrounding George Washington's dentures was that he had wooden teeth. For a long time, the rumor was that they were made from the wood of the cherry tree he cut down, but that, that wasn't true. 
though the truth isn't much better. They actually came from ivory and real human teeth pulled from the mouths of the poor and possibly his very own slaves. I will expand on that later, stay tuned. There isn't precise proof that this indeed is the truth, but there is one marking in his ledger that shows the purchase of teeth from one of his slaves. So whether those teeth are actually from like for his dentures, we don't know, but what else would they be for? I'm glad he purchased them at least. I don't know, that's just weird to me, man. Number four, at 11. Washington started young. He might have been one of the founding fathers of the USA, but his history does not stand away from injustice of the time. Before he could even make a choice about it, Washington inherited slaves at the age of 11 after his father, Augustine, died in 1743. In his will, he left his son a 280 acre farm in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Attached to that estate were 10 enslaved people, and Washington purchased at least eight more. This included a carpenter by the name of Kit, and by 1755, he had purchased four men, two women, and a child. By 1799, over 317 enslaved people were living at Mount Vernon, with 123 people being owned by Washington himself. His wife Martha also received enslaved people from her late first husband, and over the century and by the end of the American Revolution, the percentage of enslaved people rose from 28% to 40% because of their union. Number three. Card shark. 37th President of the United States, Richard Nixon, spent so much time playing cards and poker and he was gambling during World War II that he actually got pretty good at it. Subsequently, he got pretty rich. The guy was like a James Bond villain at the table. He was so good. He earned a nickname after winning so many games in a row. They called him Tricky Dick. Nixon won so much money through gambling that he was actually able to later fund his campaign for the US House of Representatives in 1946. That's how he paid the bills. How sweet is that? Of course, at that point, he was playing cards with congressmen who were also like, oh, he's not that good. That's how you know they're sore losers. They're like, eh, he's overrated. No, he just kept winning. He didn't lose any games, apparently. A US Navy officer reported that he never once saw him lose. I'm terrible at poker. I can't even keep a straight face. And also, I don't know how to play poker. So there's that too. He once bluffed a lieutenant commander out of $1,500. That's pretty interesting. But at the same time, you're like, oh, our president's really good at lying and also loves to gamble? Hmm. Interesting. Number two, sax man. Just like LimeWire told us those many years growing up, Bill Clinton did not have relations with that woman. Bill Clinton, the 42nd president of the United States, of course, is remembered for that Monica Lewinsky scandal, right? That was a whole thing, we remember that. That was weird and all, but um, did you know he can rip the saxophone? Yeah, I would get myself in an entanglement as well if I heard that in the next room. Are you kidding me? That music is like cinnamon to my ears. I want to just inhale that. We love a jazz sax, honestly. He was called the Elvis Canada at this point because it was definitely odd to just go and freestyle on the Arsenio Hall show days after winning the California primary, but you do you, honey. We're just watching. Kicking off the list at number 10, Hot for Teacher. Millard Fillmore, for one, looks strikingly similar to Alec Baldwin, but aside from that, he was also the 13th president of the United States of America. He became president in 1850 after Zachary Taylor passed away in an odd, tragic way, but I'll save that one for last. But Fillmore, this man had a thing for his teacher. Yeah, it's kind of a no-no, right? They were a couple years apart. Her name was Abigail Powers. And then the Miller Center of Public Affairs recalls that Miss Powers would often loan him books and encourage him to be on top of his studies. Come 1819, he proposed to her and she gladly accepted it. He was one of the only presidents who didn't have a vice president. Also important to note that he was not a great president at any means, historically. I'm talking about these weird things on this list. I don't mean like awful decisions they made historically. I mean like this dude hooked up with his teacher when he was 19. We'll say that's weird for this video. That tidbit of information is strange, but as a whole, yeah, a lot of these guys absolutely sucked. Number nine, history's second favorite mustache. When we talk about history, it's really hard not to talk about Germany and a little man with a weird mustache. World War II is the cause and effect for a lot of reasons and things today. That too could honestly be its own video, but what's rather uncommon to talk about in history's classrooms is history's second favorite mustache man, rhymes with Sosef Jalin. The battles between Germany and the Soviet Union during World War II were some of the worst, Stalingrad having the most casualties than any other battle during the war. The Soviet Union would fight back its invaders, but when they were pushing into the heart of Germany, it wasn't so much as liberating as oppressing. oppressing. The comrade in chief is known for targeting ethnic groups with starvation and having a tight grip on the Soviet people by threatening them with gulags, harsh and brutal labor camps where anyone who opposed his regime would be worked to death 
in conditions that harsh and brutal simply don't cover. Historians believe his regime was responsible for the deaths of 20 million people, which is almost double the amount of his German doppelganger. Not cool. Number 8. Abandoned by the world 1930s Germany wasn't a great place to be if you were Jewish. Matter of fact, anywhere near Germany was a bad time for Jewish people. Some people saw the writing on the wall and it was clear. Anyone lighting a menorah during the holiday season needed to leave Europe and set sail for more liberal waters. In 1939, a vessel called the St. Louis arrived in North American waters, searching for freedom and to escape persecution. Persecution that would likely lead to their deaths. This is an unfortunate black spot in Western democracies. As for the weary travelers, finding someone who would take them in was proving difficult. They tried Cuba, but were refused all but a handful. Then the US, same thing happened. They even tried glorious Canada, where they too refused them. Canada, a country of freedom and acceptance for all, turned down people in their darkest hour. Sadly, the boat returned to Europe where they met the same fate as other Jews who were oppressed by the regime. Number 7. Civil Rights I know a lot of these are World War II related, but, but bear with me guys. It had a lot of uncomfortable moments. Some that should be talked about. Acknowledging and apologizing for mistakes of the past is a sure way to have a brighter future. During World War II, there was something called the Germany First policy, meaning a lot of effort was made to defeat Germany first, but Imperial Japan was just as much as a threat. Apparently so much so that President Roosevelt wanted to put Japanese Americans in something called relocation camps. Thousands of Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians, cause oh yeah, we did it too, were taken from their homes and relocated to camps in order to prevent a second Pearl Harbor. You don't need an HR manager to tell you what an egregious act this is against civil rights. While they were not like the camps found in Europe, it's yet another dark splotch on two countries who boast about their freedoms and democracy. The camps were closed shortly after the war had ended. Number 6. Prankster Whenever I see those prank couples on Instagram, I can't even watch it. I don't do pranks. I don't want to be scared in the comfort of my own home. No thank you. So when we look back on a president who did some weird stuff, Lyndon B. Johnston needs the spotlight for a hot minute here. This is a halfway point, so we'll throw in a kind of fun one. The 36th president of the United States had this bit that he would do to all of his guests. It was pretty hilarious. Let me explain. He did this funny bit where he was driving around his ranch and then he would pretend to lose control of the steering, like he wouldn't be able to stop or slow down, the whole car would just power off and he would purposely drive, unbeknownst to his guests, he would purposely drive into a lake just to test the character out of the people beside him because his car was also a boat. It doubled down as a boat. He had one of those James Bond boat car things that you could just drive into lakes. That's also pretty annoying because I just know if that was me, I would have for sure jumped right out of the car. See you later, gang. Good luck. I'm tucking and rolling before I'm drowning in a car with Lyndon B. Johnson. No, that's not how I'm going out. Number five, giddy up. Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president of the United States, received a pretty sweet gift. It was actually meant as a joke, but this is amazing. I would definitely want this. It was the 1920s. Calvin loved riding horses, but the unfortunate part was that he was also allergic to them. I get it, man. I'm allergic to cats, but every chance I get, I just, I can't help myself. I want to just, mm, I want to <clears throat> inhale the whole thing. It's so cute. Little, mm. I get so, I, I sneeze for hours after, but I'm like, you know what, it's worth it. I don't care if I can't breathe. But back to this gift, Calvin received a mechanical horse as a joke gift. But the joke went over his head. He loved this idea, as would I. Imagine having a mechanical horse bull riding thing in your dressing room. What a better way to wake up in the morning. The best part of waking up is not Folgers. It's that mechanical horse. Have you seen this thing? Get on. Just wake up and get bucked into your vanity every day. So loud. So many spilt things. Always picking things up every day. But worth it. Worth the fun. He would also wear a cowboy hat while he rode it too. So he was committed to the bed. He didn't like, you know, just go on his pajamas. He was like, nope, I gotta put on these boots and do the... Do a lot of this, a, a lot of dipping the hat. I can't even motivate myself to do at-home workouts. Meanwhile, this dude's getting whiplash in his closet. Number four, throw hands, Roosevelt. The first president to win a Nobel Peace Prize loved to box. Sounds like a weird sentence. Yeah, that's actually how he went blind in one eye. It was a boxing injury. Again, this isn't weird per se, but like, imagine Biden doing a speech, then he just threw right hooks for three hours at a boxing ring. You'd be like, okay, that's, that's a bit weird. I'm gonna ask some questions. Why is he so good at throwing hands? He's like 92. While he was president, his boxing days continued, but come 1908, he suffered from a detached retina. Did he quit boxing after this? Yes, of course. Did he also immediately move on to jujitsu? 
Also, yes. It all began when Roosevelt was the governor of New York. He took up wrestling lessons from middleweight champ at the time, which is pretty sweet. Imagine getting tapped out by Teddy Roosevelt. Number three, Ik bin ein Belena. This may be old news to those of our older audience, but news to younger. And honestly, it's crazy that it even happened in the first place. So World War II ends, right? And the Allies are all super good friends, right? Wrong! Berlin basically gets split into two, Capitalist West and Communist East. So the Cold War kicks off, a very strong disagreement on what political and economical structure is better. As it turns out, life was just better on the West. People in the East just didn't have access to certain things the West did. So people started bailing shit. I don't blame them. So much so that a wall was built dividing the two. This may not sound like much, but it was huge. The Berlin Wall divided families, business, and put on the full display of failure that communism was. As JFK said, democracy is not perfect, but we've never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. And honestly, the guy's right. That's just kind of crazy. Number two, can't beat him, join him. Japan was the new cool kid in school, and by that, I mean they were the most powerful force in Asia in the late 1930s. Japan rapidly adopted westernized ideas, structures, and the old habit of invading foreign nations, and wrecking absolute havoc when there. Specifically, Nanking in 1937. Some historians consider this to be the beginning of World War II, but it's debatable. What's not debatable is the uncomfortable way Imperial Japanese forces treated Chinese civilians. Japan was expanding during the early 20th century, and China was next on the schedule. I'm going to recommend you Google this one at home, as there is so much naughty stuff about Nanking in 1937 that I'd get the censors a headache just thinking about it. There's a really infamous photograph that you probably haven't seen, and it's 100% not safe for work. The invasion of China and incidents like that of Nanking still have sour relations between the two nations today. Number one, the world is yours. Okay, so kind of a broad stroke here, but very fitting. I'm putting everything the British Empire did at the number one spot. I mean, come on, guys, it's the British Empire. Sure, it's no secret what they did, but there's so much to unpack here. It's a lot. Redcoats have been making things uncomfortable since the late 1600s. The American colonies and how they treated Indians, the occupation of actual India, and the opium wars in China, just to name a few. At its height, the British Empire had conquered. 25% of the Earth's land surface. And like I always say, when you get that big, you gotta break a few eggs along the way to make your omelet. 